So thank you all for coming today. Uh, my name is David Lynette. I'm the program manager here at FHI 360 for the Civil Society Organization Sustainability Index Project, or CSOSI. And uh, we're really excited to have you all here today to help us uh, launch this year's CSOSI reports and to generate some discussion around uh, the trends and issues that are affecting civil society organizations and civil society uh, sectors around the world. So we've got a very full schedule today. So without further ado, I'd like to address our first speaker, uh, our chief operating officer here at FHI 360, Ms. Deborah Kennedy Iraheta. Uh, Debbie um, has, um, has an, a career in international, um, a, an international development career that spans more than three decades. Uh, she has worked at the U.S. Agency of International Development as Mission Director for USAID Peru in the South America program. Under her leadership, many bilateral and regional programs uh, expanded their public-private partnerships and successfully used social media to inspire governments and communities to take action. She has also held leadership positions at two regional bureaus, served as Deputy Assistant Administrator for the Office of Human Resources, and was Chief Operating Officer for USAID's Tsunami Relief and Reconstruction Task Force. So please. Join me in welcoming Ms. Deborah Kennedy Iretta. Thank you, David, and welcome everybody to Academy Hall here at FHI 360. Um, I am very excited. I joined FHI 360 about four and a half years ago. One of the things that David didn't mention is after beginning at USAID as a project development officer, I quickly saw the light and switched to become a democracy and governance officer and got passionate <laughs> about rule of law and civil society development and governance, local governance. And, and so every opportunity I get, and David and Michael Cott, who unfortunately is not able to, to be here today because he's ill, um, give to join a group like this, it just, of course, why not? So um, it is, today's the launching of the, this year's Civil Society Organization Sustainability Index. As we all know, this is a pivotal time for civil society in the world, as development challenges remain as pressing as ever, and as illiberal governments and social movements increasingly challenge civil society's work and their ability to meet the needs of their societies. The index puts a spotlight on the civil society sectors in the 71 countries that it covers, revealing accomplishments, areas for improvement, and the various roadblocks preventing civil society from becoming fully sustainable, integrated, and effective tools for organizing civic action. Over the course of the morning, we will be discussing both some of the most pressing issues that civil society sectors face, as well as some of the innovative ways that they are addressing these issues head on and showing resiliency in the face of adversity. As practitioners, I know that all of us here today take very seriously our role in building their, the capacities of civil society organizations, um, building their reputations as effective civic advocates and reliable service providers, and helping them to pursue more sustainable funding models in the future. The CSO, Civil Society Sustainability, <laughs> I can't say CSOSI, so I intentionally broke it down. The Civil Society Organization Sustainability Index is a great tool to help us track the degree to which civil society sectors are getting closer to the goals and what needs remain. As a former democracy officer, I'm so excited to see how this tool has evolved over years. I hope you all find the conversations today thought-provoking and that you find this year's reports insightful and useful for your own work. Thanks to all of the individuals who are involved in its production. I know it was a group effort, staff here at FHI 360, but as importantly, partner organizations, the ICNL, USAID staff, and many more local organizations around the world. Thanks together to all of you for coming to participate in this timely discussion and for sharing the moment to us. And I would be negligent if I didn't wish everybody a happy holiday season. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie, for those remarks. Um, I'd like to now introduce our, our second speaker for the keynote introduction, Ms. V. Kate Sambangsiri from USAID. 
Uh, Ms. Sung Vansiri is currently performing the functions of Deputy Assistant Administrator at USAID's Bureau of Democracy, Conflict, and Humanitarian Assistance. She has 20 years of international development experience specializing in democratic governance, human rights, political transitions, and post-conflict stabilization issues. She joined USAID in 2002, where she helped establish its democracy and governance programs in Afghanistan and helped the State Department start up its Office of the Coordinator for Reconstruction and Stabilization. She has served as a foreign, foreign Service Officer in Indonesia, Afghanistan, and Ukraine, where she earned a Distinguished Honor Award for her leadership during the Maidan Revolution. Prior to joining USAID, she served as a Peace Corps volunteer in Nepal, worked with an NGO focused on Burmese migrant issues, and worked for the State Department's Bureau for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Sung Bansiri. Thank you. Why do we support civil society organizations? So this was a question that took me aback when I was in Ukraine, my last tour um, I had arrived, and it was um, one of my bosses at the time who shall remain nameless. And it was one of our first meetings, and he said, Kate, I know you're a democracy person, I know you're committed to this stuff, but why do we keep pouring money into these civil society organizations? Um, and me, at, like, like any good democracy officer, I had all my answers, accountability, giving voice to people, representation, protecting freedom, rights. I said, yeah, 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 okay. But what does that really mean? I'm a finance guy. Show me the return on the investment. We've been working in this repressive environment. Um, you know, I, I'm not seeing anything come out of this. And if we pulled out our support today, what would happen? I had all the, the answers I gave him. I, I don't think I was particularly convincing. Um, but then a few months after that, the Maidan revolution happened in Ukraine. And words like giving voice to citizens um, began to have new meaning. And he and others could see citizens, civic actors, civil society groups that we'd worked with for long periods of time come out on the street, protest, demand, channel voices in a way that was very tangible and very real. And perhaps even more impressively, after the heady days of the revolution, which you know I think it makes it easy for anybody to be a supporter of democracy, but perhaps even more impressive was after the revolution and that slog of trying to get reforms in place, when the spotlights are gone, um, but when the, the real work really begins. And you could see those civic groups that we've been working with for years and years join parliament, join government, push reforms from within, create networks or revitalize networks across the country now that they have the space to do so, advocate for policy reforms, and at the same time, you know, you have civic actors inside parliament advocating for reforms on the outside and then mobilizing groups of people from across the country to stand right in front of that same parliament hall, you know, advocating for those bills that the, their, their colleagues were pushing for from within. And you could see all of that come together in a really clear and compelling way. And, and not to gloss over the difficulties that have transpired then and since then, but at least what my boss said to me, you know, after a few months of that and then towards the end of my tour, he said, you know, I was, I was a skeptic at the beginning, a real skeptic. But now, after all this, I get it. I get why we do this. And I know I'm not talking to a room of skeptics here today, and I don't need to convince anyone here of the value of working with civil society organizations and the importance of their sustainability. Um, I know that, um, but what I'd really like to do here in just the few minutes we have together in, in um, the, my opening remarks is to clarify and kind of pull together the, civil society, the importance of civil society sustainability with some of the goals and priorities under um, USAID right now in the current administration. And if anybody has been um, talked to anyone at USAID lately, I know many of the people in the crowd are USAID folks, you will have heard the term journey to self-reliance. Hands for anyone in this room who's never heard that term. <laughs> okay, um, so journey self-reliance, um, as many of you all are aware, our administrator, Mark Green, has said very clearly over and over again, he has articulated the vision that for the the purpose of foreign assistance is to end its need to exist. 
And that doesn't mean that tomorrow we're closing up shop, graduating countries, and walking out the door. It means that we have to have a clear understanding of where a country is in its journey to self-reliance, which means the underlying assumption is that no country wants to be dependent on external actors to fulfill its aspirations forever. No country wants to actually be a donor recipient forever. And hence, the journey to self-reliance eventually transforming that relationship and no longer being a traditional aid recipient. Now, where does civil society, and so that's, that's the framework for how we're operating right now and a vision. Um, so how have we uh, put that together to operationalize it and where does civil society fit in, civil society sustainability in particular? Like any good USAID uh, project, we have put together um, metrics and country roadmaps. This is so we have clear data that shows us where a country is on um, its capacity as well as its commitment. And there are roadmaps that map out where countries are. This is based on 17 sources of publicly available data. And you can actually see countries plotted out on this map, a road map. And this is the start of the conversation in countries. This is not determinative. It's not that you're in the top right-hand quadrant, therefore you graduate and we're done. It is a tool for engaging with countries and saying, hey, based on publicly available data, this is where we see where the country's commitment and capacity is, and let's work together to figure out how we get from here to there. Recognizing, as all of us in this room knows, it is not a linear path, um, and that there are many external factors, and there's questions about reliability of data, time lags, all that, but it's a, it's a starting point for the conversation. Embedded within this and the metrics, of course, there are civil society ones. There are metrics under open and accountable governance, there's one for inclusive development, and then on the capacity side, on the commitment side, excuse me, there's the capacity for civil society to engage. But if you step back from this and look at the big picture of the journey, you talk about the role of civil society, I think many of us, or most of us in this room will understand that intuitively, there is no journey and there is no self-reliance without the role of civil society. You can't have external actors, like donors, being the ones calling governments into account in a post-transition type environment. You need to build up the capacity and have sustainable long-term internal actors in the form of civil society to make the democratic system work overall. So we all know that the healthy civil society is, is critical for this, these responses. Um, the other area where this is key in the role of civil society is key in terms of the priorities under aid currently is in terms of countering resurgent authoritarianism. That's the, the second area I'll mention today. No one in this room is unaware of the democratic trends and the backsliding that's occurred. It is not a new phenomenon. It's one that we all have collectively been grappling with as a community for several years. One nuance we put on it um, in terms of countering authoritarian trends and it's captured in our national security strategy, I think quite well, is also the role of external actors in terms of exporting authoritarian and other trends and ideas and how that syncs up with internal actor roles. And then how do we as a community of donors, of assistance providers, et cetera, work on those issues. So that's also something that we're, we're continuing to grapple with. And of course, civil society is a, a key role in that in terms of developing the domestic capacity to engage and address some of these issues and trends. Which brings me to today. So we as USAID are constantly through the Democracy Rights and Governance Center. We're constantly trying to approve the effectiveness of our democracy programs. We're constantly trying to get a handle on these trends and be strategic. We know resources are limited to be strategic about how we deploy those resources. So tools like the CSO Sustainability Index are key to that. Um, we're really honored to have been, since 1997, published the first Sustainability Index, which started, as many of you all know, in the Europe and Eurasia region, but has expanded now to the 71 countries that Debbie mentioned. I won't go into the dimensions of the index because I believe our next speaker will take us through those dimensions and talk through where the trends are, only just to say that having this time data and ge with the geographic diversity has really enabled us to see advances, setbacks across regions and to be able to do comparisons as well as across sub-regions and countries and that's really a valuable 
tool to us as we grapple with all these issues. The CSOSI is not one of the um, metrics for the journey to self-reliance, but we're using it as a secondary metrics to unpack some of the civil society issues. And we also challenge and ask folks in the room here if we can continue to work together and find ways to keep improving these tools, to keep increasing its academic rigor and helping us to utilize it effectively within. We have a lot to learn um, from all of you today, um, and I hope we'll use this opportunity to think together, hear trends, learn, challenge. Please also challenge us within USAID um, where you think we're missing the boat on some of these issues and where, how we could be um, working together more effectively because collectively I think our goal in this partnership obviously is to continue to support civil society in its journey and to continue to be able to answer that question of why are we supporting civil society? And also, not only that, but also how we can do it better together. So thank you for your time. Thank you for all of your efforts and your partnership. And look forward to today's discussions. Thank you so much, Kate, for those uh, interesting remarks that really help us orient our event here today and our, our thinking on these issues. Uh, so at this time, I'd like to call up my counterpart on the CSOSI uh, at, at our partner organization, uh, ICNL, the International Center for not -for profit Law. Uh, before we go into our panel discussion, where we uh, discuss the sort of trends and developments and how they are affected by the, you know, how they affect the journey of self-reliance, we'd like to just give a brief overview of the, the findings of the, of the CSOSI in 2017. Jennifer? Sorry? Yeah, yeah, come on. So again, so this is just to go over the data of the CSOSI. Uh, and, the, and the data of the CSOSI is the, the country level scores. Uh, so to recap, there are 71 countries uh, overall covered by the CSOSI. Those are divided into four regions, which are Central and Eastern Europe and Eurasia, Asia, uh, the Middle East and North Africa, and Sub-Saharan Africa. And each of these 71 countries gets seven dimension level scores. The dimensions of sustainability that are covered by the index are the legal environment, organizational capacity, financial viability, advocacy, service provision, sectoral infrastructure, and public image. And these scores are determined by local, uh, a, a panel of local experts and representatives from CSOs that are convened by a local implementing partner in each country, uh, which is usually a local CSO itself. And these seven scores are averaged into an overall CSO sustainability score for each country for each year. And we divide these, this range of, of, of seven score uh, of one to seven into th three sort of categories or, or tiers or, or ranges of scores. From 5.1 to seven is considered sustainability impeded. From 3.1 to five is considered sustainability evolving. And from 1.0 to 3.0 is considered sustainability enhanced. So that's to say that the highest level of sustainability is a one, one to three being sustainability enhanced, and the lowest level of sustainability is a seven, with five to seven being sustainability impeded. So this map is color-coded. Uh, it's the 71 countries covered by the index, color-coded by which one of these tiers their overall score falls into. So you can see that there are six countries, only six, that have an overall score in 2017 that was in sustainability enhanced. Uh, there were 50 countries that were in sustainability evolving and 15 that were in sustainability impeded. Uh, and also, as a, as a side note, the, uh, the highest score overall was Estonia and the lowest score overall, score overall was Azerbaijan. And this map is color-coded by whether the overall score improved from 2016 to 2017 in green, deteriorated from 2016 to 2017 in red, or stayed the same in beige. And here we see that 12 countries saw their overall score improve in 2017, 38 countries' scores remained the same, and 20 countries saw their score deteriorate. And this slide breaks down the scores uh, at the dimension level, showing the average score among the 71 countries for each dimension. You see that for six of the seven dimensions, the average score is in the sustainability evolving tier, and for one, it's in sustainability impeded. The highest score, or the score with the, the dimension with the strongest scores, advocacy at a 3.9, uh, 
Um, there are actually 10 countries in the index who have an advocacy score uh, in sustainability enhanced. Those are the six of the seven northern tier countries. Northern tier refers to the Central European and Baltic countries covered by the index, um, as well as uh, Bulgaria, Armenia, Ukraine, and South Africa. And only seven countries had an advocacy score in sustainability uh, impeded, and those were Yemen, Sudan, Belarus, Egypt, Azerbaijan, and Ethiopia. By contrast with financial viability, 37 of the 71 countries had, an, had, a, had a financial viability score and sustainability impeded, and only three countries were in sustainability enhanced, and those were Estonia, Czech Republic, and Poland. This slide shows the dimensions again, but by the level of change, whether they were improving or deteriorating from 2016 to 2017. You see that across most of the dimensions, the, the scores deteriorated from 2016 to 2017. The only exception was sectoral infrastructure, which had a net improvement. And sectoral infrastructure refers to the, the training and resources that CSOs have at their disposal, their level of networking and collaboration amongst themselves and with other sectors. But you see the legal environment uh, deteriorated quite significantly. Uh, just to put that in perspective, each individual country only improves or deteriorates uh, by about 0 0.1 to 0 0.3 in any given year. So for the countries that deteriorated to outweigh the countries that improved by a total of 4.5 is pretty significant. Okay, now I'll hand it over to my colleague Jennifer Stewart for a, a quick regional breakdown. Hi, so David provided a quick overview of things at a global level and at a dimension level. I'm going to try to break it down a little bit, looking at the individual regions and some of the main trends that we saw there. Um, of course, as David mentioned, each country report has seven dimension scores as well as an overall sustainability score, which means that we're looking at over 560 individual scores. Um, and the country reports, which tend to be about 10 pages long, mean that there's 600 pages of information um, in these publications. So I'm going to be just covering the very tip of the iceberg here. So starting with Europe and Eurasia, um, which was, as mentioned, is the first region in which the CSOSI was developed and introduced. Um, this was the 21st edition for this region, and it covers 24 countries, most of which have graduated from USAID assistance. Um, as you can see, this is using the same color coding as on David's maps. Um, the, uh, Estonia has the highest score um, at 2.1. It is, as David mentioned, the highest score of any country um, covered in the CSOSI, which is probably not surprising. And there are another five countries that also had scores in sustainability enhanced. Um, but you can see there's also a huge range of scores within this region, and two of them, Belarus and Azerbaijan, have scores in sustainability impeded, the lowest tier of sustainability. Um, and as David also mentioned, Azerbaijan has the lowest overall CSO sustainability score of any of the 71 countries covered in the various regional editions of the 2017 index. In 2017, changes in overall sustainability in this region were pretty evenly split. Um, if you can see the numbers in red with a down arrow, those show the countries that had deteriorating overall sustainability levels during the year. There were five of those, Azerbaijan, Hungary, Latvia, Poland, and Romania. And the countries <clears throat> with their scores in green with an upward arrow show the six countries that improved during the year, Albania, Armenia, Moldova, Russia, Slovenia, and Ukraine. Um, if we look at the various dimensions in this region, uh, we see that 12 countries, or half of those covered by this edition of the index, had regression in the legal environment during the year. Um, governments in a diverse range of countries, including both long-standing EU members like Poland, and Hungary, as well as countries that have long been led by repressive regimes such as Belarus and Azerbaijan, all further tightened their control over the civil sector during the year. Restrictions took a variety of forms, but as will be discussed more in the panel discussion later, um, commonly focused on restricting CSOs' access to funding or increasing reporting requirements, as well as state harassment of CSOs criticizing the work of the government or otherwise holding it accountable. Um, these increasingly restrictive legal environments were often accompanied by decreases in the sector's public image. Ten e and &E countries reported deterioration in the public image dimension this year, over half of which also had worse legal environment scores. The decrease in public image was often driven by negative rhetoric by the government and pro-government media towards CSOs, especially those that are foreign funded and or critical of the government. Um, the negative rhetoric often consisted of accusations that CSOs serve, serve foreign interests, including those of George Soros, 
Um, and this phenomenon was particularly pronounced in the northern tier, where six countries reported these kinds of issues this year. On the positive side, there were notable advances in the infrastructure supporting the sector in E&E during the year, and nine countries recorded improvements in the sectoral infrastructure dimension. Improved cooperation within the sector um, was a common component of these improvements, particularly in the northern and southern tier countries, which include um, the Baltics, uh, the Balkans, and the Visegrad countries, and increased capacity of intermediary support organizations and resource centers contributed to improvements in Russia, Ukraine, and Armenia. Um, moving on to Sub-Saharan Africa, this edition of the index covers 31 countries from all regions of Africa, and this was the ninth year that Sub-Saharan Africa was covered by the index. Um, as you can see from this slide, the range of overall CSO sustainability scores is not quite as great as in uh, quite as great in Africa as it is in e, e but there's still a large spread from a 3.6 in South Africa down to a 5.7 in Ethiopia and Angola. As you can see, no country in Sub-Saharan Africa has overall sustainability scores and sustainability enhanced. And in fact, only a single dimension score, advocacy in South Africa, falls in this uppermost tier of sustainability within this region, showing the great amount of work that remains to be done. About two-thirds of the countries had scores in sustainability evolving this year, and the remaining 10 had scores in sustainability impeded. Overall, sustainability was fairly stable in Africa in 2017. Uh, 20 countries reported no change in their overall scores from the previous year, while six countries, Botswana, Burundi, Kenya, Namibia, Senegal, and Uganda reported decline, and five countries, Angola, the Gambia, Guinea, Niger, and Sierra Leone reported improvement. Um, advocacy made some notable advances in Sub-Saharan Africa during the year. There were 13 countries reporting improvement in this dimension. Improvement was mostly attributed to CSO's better relations with the government, as well as targeted, uh, well-targeted advocacy campaigns. Interestingly, the countries reporting improvements in this dimension included both countries at the lower end of the scoring scale in this dimension, such as Ethiopia and Angola, as well as some of the higher performers in advocacy, such as Kenya, Nigeria, and Zambia. There are also some positive developments in service provision, which was already one of the strongest dimensions in Sub-Saharan Africa. In 2017, CSOs across the region were deeply involved in meeting the needs of the massive number of people affected by conflict, poverty, and famine, and eight countries reported improvements in this dimension. On the other hand, as an e and &E, legal environment was the dimension with the most deterioration. Um, and we had 16 countries, again, slightly more than half of those covered, reporting worse legal environments during the year. This is an unfortunate trend that we see across all of the regions of the index. Governments, again, took a variety of actions to constrain the voices of critical CSOs during the year, including passing new laws that introduced more stringent registration and reporting requirements, as well as detaining, fining, and imprisoning CSO staff and breaking up demonstrations. Moving on to the Middle East and North Africa, this year we published the sixth edition of the MENA Index, which covers seven countries in the region. Um, again, overall CSO sustainability scores cover a fairly wide range, with Lebanon, oh, we have, sorry, with Lebanon at a 3.9 and Egypt down at a 5.6. Um, as you can see, there's a fairly even split between those with overall sustainability scores falling in sustainability evolving um, in the yellow and those in sustainability impeded in the red. And in this region, um, not dissimilar to Africa, there's not a single score at the dimension level that reaches sustainability evolving. Three countries and territories, Yemen, Egypt, and West Bank Gaza, experienced deterioration in overall CSO sustainability during the year. The situation in Egypt, which already had the lowest level of sustainability in the region, was particularly dire, with negative developments noted in nearly every dimension. Um, overall sustainability did not change in the other four countries. Um, as was the case in Sub-Saharan Africa, we saw significant improvements in advocacy during the year, and three countries, Iraq, Jordan, and Lebanon, reported better advocacy scores, while two countries, Egypt and Yemen, reported that advocacy had become more constrained during the year. However, it was interesting to note that even in these countries, the reports um, note that CSOs continued to carry out campaigns to address issues of public concern. As is the case in all regions, financial viability was the weakest dimension in nearly all of the MENA countries covered by the index, and the situation got significantly worse in 2017. In all countries but Morocco, CSOs experienced a deterioration in financial viability, whether due to shifting donor priorities, new legal obstacles, or the emergence of larger economic challenges. 
Um, and then again, the legal environment dimension, which was already impeded, and more than half of the countries covered by the index also experienced significant downturn in 2017, with five countries, all but Jordan and Morocco, experiencing deterioration in this dimension. And last but not least, um, we have the Asia edition of the index, which covers nine countries. Um, this is the newest addition to the CSOSI family. It was published for just the fourth time in 2017. Um, and this year's report included for the first time Burma. As you can see, all nine countries had overall CSO sustainability ratings in the middle tier of sustainability evolving. Despite the difficult situation in the Philippines over the past few years, it still has the highest level of sustainability of the countries covered in Asia at 3.4, while Thailand had the lowest level of CSO sustainability with a score of 4.7. Um, 2017 was a tough year in these nine countries. As you can see, only Indonesia reported an improvement in overall sustainability, while five countries, Bangladesh, Cambodia, Pakistan, the Philippines, and Sri Lanka, reported deteriorating conditions for CSO sustainability. Many of the regressing scores were the result of heightened government harassment and declines in foreign funding. There's also little good news among these nine countries when looking at the individual dimensions. The dimension with the most positive change was service provision, but even there, there were just two countries, Indonesia and the Philippines, that noted improvements, both due to the development of new services. And then in line with the other regions, six of the nine countries covered in this edition of the index reported deterioration in the legal environment dimension during the year, um, and not a single country reported improvement. Bangladesh and Cambodia reported particularly significant levels of deterioration in their legal environments in 2017, with both countries taking action to shrink civic space through both legal and extra-legal restrictions and attacks on CSOs. Um, I hope this is obviously, again, just a quick overview of some of the findings. Um, hopefully it's piqued your interest to take a closer look at the reports and the data, um, and I'm going to turn it over to David to give you an idea of where you can find some of that information. Great. Thanks, Jennifer. So if you'd like to explore the data more, you can go to www.csosi.org, where we have our data dashboard. Uh, it allows you to visualize the data in several different ways and pick which countries you're interested in, which dimensions you're interested in. Here are just a few screenshots of the types of visualizations you can pull up from the dashboard. Uh, you can also download the, the data, both from 2017 and all the historical data, uh, t through Excel to uh, crunch the numbers or to create whatever other visualizations that you know, you're interested in or that you know, fit your research needs. So at this time I'd like to call up uh, our moderator for the panel discussion, Michael Tettleman, as well as our panelists, Thomas Carruthers, Kathy Shea, Jenna White, and Joseph Sani. Uh, Michael's going to help uh, guide us through a discussion of some of the trends and developments that were coming out of the narrative reports in 2017 that uh, continue to affect civil society sustainability and through that the, the journey to self-reliance. Thank you, David. Come on. You know, why don't you guys, it, it doesn't matter. You know, just wherever. I'll, I'll um, start with you. Make yourself at home. There's no order. Come on in. Of course. I'll sit here, though. That's okay. Why don't I sit there? Okay. Great. Good morning, everybody, and welcome again. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to have you all here. Um, this really exciting event. Um, again, my name is Mike Tettleman. I'm deputy director of our business unit at FHI 360 called Global Education Engagement Employment that focuses on, among other things, civil society and peace building and the work of the CSO SI. I'm really honored and delighted to be the moderator for this uh, distinguished group of panelists and the uh, exciting discussion on cross-cutting trends that we're about to have. So we've got about an hour. Um, what I'd like to do first is just uh, give you a sense of each of the speakers, their bios, um, and then we will proceed um, to just uh, go through each speaker, um, starting with Catherine Shea, who will talk about closing civic space, authoritarian challenges, some questions for Catherine, and then Thomas Carruthers, focusing on liberal civic activism and CSO legitimacy issues, 
and then we'll turn to Jenna for some questions around reduced funding and threats to financial viability for CSOs, and then close with Joseph Sani and Jennifer Stewart to talk about how these trends are captured by the CSO SI. So that'll probably be around 40 minutes or so, and then open it up <coughs> for questions and answers from you all. So looking forward. So without further ado, let me just uh, at least introduce our speakers. Um, so Catherine Shea is Vice President of Programs for the International Center for Not-for-Profit Law. Catherine is a lawyer and public policy expert specializing in the development of an enabling legal environment for civil society and citizen participation worldwide. Her international experience providing assistance to the development of laws, governing foundations, associations, and other not-for-profit organizations spans 27 countries and includes representing ICNL before high-level officials of foreign governments, <coughs> international institutions, and government and private organizations on significant policy issues. Thomas Carruthers is Senior Vice President for Studies, Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. <coughs> Thomas is Senior Vice President for Studies at the Carnegie Endowment, where he oversees all of the endowment's research programs. Widely recognized as a leading authority on democratization, he's worked on democracy and governance assistance projects <coughs> around the world for many public and private organizations. He's worked extensively on issues relating to civil society development, including the trend towards closing civic space globally. And the bios uh, that you have will provide more detail. So welcome, Thomas. Jenna White <coughs> is, excuse me, technical advisor at LINK uh, and program director for facilitating financial sustainability. Jenna is a program director uh, and with the U.S. based small business that assists local and international organizations to increase institutional capacity. At LINK, Jenna directs the Facilitating Financial Sustainability, FFS, and the local systems practice activities under USAID Local Works. Under FFS, LINK leads a consortium of partners to research and test ways to improve CSO's financial sustainability by mobilizing new sources of philanthropic and commercial resources. Joseph Sani is technical advisor at FHI 360. Dr. Sani is an international development, peace building, and peacekeeping specialist. Currently serves as technical advisor at FHI, and in this capacity supports and advises on innovative approaches to the CSO SI, as well as on FHI 360 programming in the areas of civil society development, capacity strengthening, governance, and peace building in fragile and post-conflict environments. And Jennifer, whom you heard from uh, earlier is program manager at ICNL. Jennifer has over 20 years of experience designing, implementing, monitoring, and evaluating democracy and governance programs with an emphasis on civil society strengthening and has been involved with the CSO SI since its early days, overseeing its production from 2000 to 2004 as a civil society specialist in USAID's Regional Bureau for Europe and Eurasia. So you can tell we have a really wonderful array of panelists uh, to, to, to uh, address these themes, and i um, excited to get started. Okay, so Catherine, we will first start with you. Welcome again, great to have you here. Um, and we'll just start by posing a couple broad questions. If you don't mind just speaking to those, that'd be great. Again, focusing on that theme of closing civic space and authoritarian challenges. All right, so here's some questions uh, for you to consider and maybe uh, raise to the audience. So first, what are some of the tactics that authoritarian governments have used to restrict civic space, particularly the legal space for CSOs to operate? Clearly, we were hearing that the legal environment is so challenged in so many places. Um, it seems like the, in the past, there's a clear line between authoritarian governments and democratic governments. And with the rise of populist and nationalist parties in government, the line has become more blurred. Where are we seeing this kind of democratic backsliding take place? And how have these governments succeeded in overcoming opposition from civil society to roll back liberal democracy in their countries? So why don't you speak to that for a few minutes and we'll proceed. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll start with your first question, if that's okay. That would be um, First delightful. of all, I wanna say thank you to you and to FHI 360, as well as to USAID for hosting this event. Um, they've been part of the CSOSI process for a long time and I was excited to see uh, our, your materials up there and, and, and participate in this launch. Um, you know, as we've all noted, the, the index has tracked the rise of authoritarianism and the closing of civic space. 
Um, it's been well documented in the index as well as elsewhere. Um, I'm going to focus a little on legal space because that's what I know about. But, and you know, at ICNL we keep data as well, and our data shows that since uh, 2012, there's been 72 countries that have imposed over 144 restrictions on civil society legally across the world. And as Jennifer mentioned earlier, the tactics have included closing C uh, CSOs down, making it hard for them to form, having smear campaigns, harassment, additional reporting, and the like. Um, I'm going to raise four issues that were particularly interesting that I thought came out of the reports this year um, in terms of the tactics that are being used. Um, one was direct government control of funding, which was sort of a new twist on an old issue. Um, we've talked a lot about the fact that uh, there have been a lot of impediments to CSO financing over the years, particularly international financing. But this year, we saw this uh, new development in Poland. In 2017, Poland passed a law that allows a government agency that reports directly to the prime minister to essentially control uh, certain types of international funding that come in as well as other public funding. So this includes um, European Union funding that comes into Poland, the so-called Norway grants, the funds that come from Norway, which uh, between those sources are among the largest sources of funding for CSOs across Central and Eastern Europe. So it's a fairly big restriction. Now we've seen proposals in the past to control, uh, directly control government funding. And one thing that comes to mind is Venezuela's uh, international cooperation law that was proposed in 20, 2006 and came up over and over again, but was never passed. Um, but this is one of the few efforts that actually succeeded. Um, so it's a worrisome development and it's significant because of course it gives this agency the ability to sort of pick the winners and losers, who, who gets funding and who doesn't. Something we'll be monitoring over the coming year because um, it'll be now in its implementation phase. So that's problem with finance, financial restrictions. We've also seen a rise in non-financial restrictions, particularly those that deal with information and research, information sharing and research. I'll give just two examples of that. You know, Egypt passed a law that most of us know about last year, uh, tightening the strict controls already on CSOs even further. Um, so the new law basically requires that CSOs have to obtain prior government approval before they can carry out field research or conduct an opinion poll. Um, so that's uh, very problematic. Also, you can't collaborate with a foreign group or even a local group unless you get government approval in, in advance. So this really constricts the ability to collaborate and share information. Mm -hmm. Similarly, in Tanzania, we saw this year um, amendments to the Statistics Act. Um, uh, basically, you can't now uh, contradict or distort government statistics um, that are uh, approved by an agency or even communicate statistical information um, without government approval. Third thing I think we should, uh, that I noticed in, the, in this report, and this, there were a lot of examples of this, so I'll just give you a few. There's been a real uptick in restrictions on cybercrime, um, as well as other laws that re restrict access to digital space. A um, couple examples in Bangladesh, there's an ICT Act. It allows criminal prosecutions of anybody who transmits false or obscene materials that quote unquote cause another person to become dishonest or corrupt. A really broad standard that allows a fair amount of discretion uh, in, in prosecuting CSOs and others. And the government has used that discretion. It's filed 300 cases in the first seven months of 2017 alone. Um, so fairly uh, strict requirement there. We also saw in the West Bank and Gaza a new cyber crimes law. It allows for restrictions on online expression, again on vague grounds. If you interfere with state security or social harmony, uh, you can be prosecuted and the fines include imprisonment. Um, and in fact, last September, a human rights defender was criminally charged under this new law for simply making Facebook posts that were critical of the government. Final point um, I'll make on this is uh, we've seen a rise in extra legal measures. Governments doing things that actually aren't authorized by the law. Now we've seen over the years that the index has tracked a flurry of legislative activity. Um, and many of these laws are well into their implementation phase now. So there's a huge burden on CSOs to contend with the consequences. Complex systems of reporting, audits, taxes, fees, inspections, and the like, um, strangling civil society by regulation. Um, but the compliance can be particularly complicated when the government is imposing extra legal requirements uh, that are hard to, by, by their nature or hard to predict. So we saw, for example, last year, South Sudan, the National Security Service, began to demand that CSOs get permission anytime they wanted to hold a workshop or event. And we've seen similar restrictions in, in Yemen, Jordan, and the West Bank. In Iraq, um, one of our big successes way back when we worked in Iraq was there used to be 21 forms to register. It was reduced to four. We thought that was great. 
until this year when all of a sudden there's a rise, government can ask you for more documents if they want to. Um, again, despite the law's requirement that you'll, you know, there's a fairly limited number of things, information you have to provide. You know, finally in Belarus, the state uh, began charging profit and income taxes on foreign funds, um, but the president personally decides who has to pay it. It's an 18% tax um, on donations from abroad, and basically, the president says, you pay, you don't. Um, Basically, this underscores, I think, in our mind, the seriousness of focusing not just on the moment when a law is passed, which we oftentimes see in the index, but also the need to support civil society during the implementation phase and as they navigate these various restrictions. Great. Well, Kathy, thank you. That was uh, quite a really helpful and vivid array of examples now of legal restrictions, as you say, extra legal restrictions that are starting to be imposed. Um, that's very important. Thank you. Did you want to also talk about um, that line of the oh, blurring sure. of um, authoritarian and democratic governments? In yeah, sure. Um, you know, I think the question is referring to those countries that are either already or moving towards uh, what we call a lib what's been called mm -hmm. liberal democracy right. or demat uh, democrat democratic authoritarian hybrid, mm -hmm. because of course we still see many traditional authoritarian societies in the world. What I think has been striking about some of these countries is that, you know. We had thought many of them to be safely democratic when you look at a Poland or a Hungary, and, you know, um, and this was not just in terms of how they elected their leaders, but in how they were governed. Um, basically, I think one of the key takeaways from, from looking at some of the, what these governments are doing is that they oftentimes, these types of societies oftentimes use the structures of democracy um, to increase state control. So essentially, they'll take control of independent institutions, the courts, prosecutors, get involved in universities. We also frequently see attempts to control media, either by buying or consolidating media groups, um, or by prosecuting journalists for sedition or defamation, as we've seen in Bangladesh, or prosecuting media firms, as we've seen in the Philippines. Right. Um, in terms of how this affects civil society, you know, once you have control of these independent institutions, you have limited the opportunity for redress, so there's really nowhere to go. Um, and you've limited voice, because there's nowhere to speak out. So there have been effective techniques in making sure that civil society is, is, doesn't have much of a chance to speak back. Um, also, these societies, I think, have tended to equate democracy with majoritarianism. In other words, what we see is, well, we won the election, so deal with it. <laughs> Um, but that means there's a lack of, lack of checks and balances and protection of minority rights that we frequently associate with democratic societies and a lack of pluralism. I think one thing that, to bring it back to the index, is this it underscores something that we've, said in the, we've seen in the index for many, many years, which is the need to, for CSOs to build strong constituencies, to get the support of local um, beneficiaries um, so that they have a voice and that they have support when they try to fight back. Um, because we've seen in the index for many years that when, where such constituency building is weak, um, civil society lacks public support and comes up when it comes under attack. Um, so I think that, um, I guess we've already echoed that theme too, the need to build capacity mm -hmm. in this area is important. Great, thanks Kathy, that's really helpful and um, thoughtful about um, how uh, governments can use that apparatus of uh, government to sort of impose, you know, restrictions and yet that importance of resilience at that local level to counter. So thank you, really uh, helpful. Great. Thomas, let's turn it over to you for a little bit um, to focus on those themes of illiberal civic activism and CSO legitimacy issues. Um, so we've got a couple questions for you and uh, really appreciate your being here. Uh, first one, um, how are the new illiberal social movements around the world changing how we think about civil society? And second, how have these movements challenged the legitimacy of democracy and rights promoting CSOs, especially those funded by international donor agencies? Thank you. <clears throat> Pleasure to be here. One of the defining characteristics of global civil society today is, as Kathy described, the battle over space. But another defining characteristic is a much greater heterogeneity of civil society around the world moving away from a conception we might have had 20 or 30 years ago of civil society as, in some ways, a relatively homogeneous sector. This heterogeneity affects the shape of organizations, how they're formed, the causes that they pursue, and the tactics that they use. Now, one fundamental element of this heterogeneity is the rise of illiberal movements and organizations in many different parts of the world. 
just to name a few examples. In Thailand, over the last 10 years, there have been a number of ethno-nationalist or royalist movements, civic movements, that have supported uh, anti-democratic uh, activism in the country. In Ukraine, in the flourishing of civil society over the last 10 years, a small but nevertheless present segment has been the rise of far-right nationalist groups that have used the opening to take advantage to pursue their own causes. In Turkey, Islamic civil society has many forms, but parts of it are illiberal and have taken advantage of the changed political environment there and contributed to it to pursue a number of, of illiberal actions and policies there. In Georgia, uh, the traditional sort of liberal focus of civil society in the 1990s and 2000s on anti-corruption and parliamentary transparency has been challenged by another part of civil society that's quite anti-Western and pro-Russian in a number of its values and policies. Poland, uh, the same law and justice is associated with a number of civic movements that work against liberal values in different ways. India, uh, the rise of Hindu nationalism as a political force in India has been accompanied by civic movements, citizens' organizations uh, that support an exclusionary view of Indian citizenship and Indian national identity. And in Brazil, uh, to bring it closer to, to <coughs> this hemisphere, Brazil has seen the rise of a number of illiberal civic groups associated in the last five years with some of the actions against uh, the political elite and now the rise of a right-wing populist president. What do we mean by illiberal? <clears throat> we could spend a lot of time trying to define it. Uh, you can't just say illiberal is what you don't like. It's not good enough. Uh, illiberal as a cause is a denial of the basic principles of democracy in pursuing a cause that denies the legitimacy of an elected democratic leader or basic democratic principles. So therefore, for example, movements in Thailand that uh, wanted to return Thailand to a royalist monarchy or a military government were, I would say, by nature, illiberal. <clears throat> also causes that deny the, or sort of seek the abridgment of rights and pursue exclusionary causes in which there's a basic discrimination or built-in differential in how citizens should be treated on the basis of different identity characteristics are also illiberal. Illiberalism is also about tactics. Uh, illiberalism is usually about delegitimizing those who you oppose and denying the legitimacy of opposition and saying there's really only one right view and it's this and anybody who disagrees is by nature illegitimate. Another tactic is aligning with larger political projects or forces that are basically anti-democratic and so therefore a civic movement that say in Poland associates itself with the uh, gutting of the independent judiciary and calls for the demise of independent institutions for the sake of majoritarian principles. And another tactic, of course, is violence, is the use of social violence, political violence to achieve aims, which is, uh, by my definition at least, inherently illiberal. Why is this happening? It's not really a mystery in the sense that we're living through an age of the fatigue of many democratic systems that have not been providing uh, the kinds of results and the kinds of governance that citizens want which gives rise, for example, in Brazil, the frustration with the political elite and the frustration with the corruption give rise to movements that deny the legitimacy of basic democratic processes that have brought that elite to power. The greater assertiveness of authoritarian powers uh, across borders, which are in some cases supporting these groups or animating them or providing inspiration, so the greater assertiveness of Russia and its neighborhood and other authoritarian actors helps this. And also, obviously, the anti-globalization, anti-Western trend um, that we see in a number of places, which is a larger pendulum swinging against the idea of sort of Western values as being universal values and saying they're local particular values that are a reaction to, to globalization in whatever forms it might happen to take. So there are a number of deep structural causes that are driving this. Just a few words about what this means for the civic domain. First and foremost, it means that the civic domain is much more a zone of contestation within itself. I was saying before to, to someone, I think it was Kate, that we, we tended to think in the 1990s and 2000s of civil society in terms of its relationship to the government. And we to say, well, there's civil society here and the government there, and the question is, does civil society act as a partner to government? Does it act as a watchdog, does it challenge? And we talked about civil society government relations. 
The story in many societies today is the battle within civil society among itself over values and principles and tactics and ideas and so forth. And so this notion of a simple dimension between civil society and the government has to be replaced by a much more complicated view of civil society in most countries is a very contested zone with, with very different actors working at cross purposes with each other. Uh, a second implication is there's a much greater degree of confrontation and fighting among civil society groups and, and direct action to try to hurt other groups and to limit their agenda and limit their activities and so forth. So it's a much harsher domain characterized by, by open confrontation. Third characteristic is claims of authenticity are now much more contested. We used to have a simplistic idea that if a group was, quote, grassroots or had constituents, it was authentic or uh, legitimate. These days, legitimacy is contested everywhere. And many of these illiberal groups contest the legitimacy or authenticity of groups that they oppose. And they claim that they are the authentic voice of the people. And they have a dual characteristic. On the one hand, they're often very much minority groups uh, at the margins or the sidelines of society, yet they claim to speak for a silent majority of the country. And so they say, well, we're a besieged minority, but we're actually speaking for the majority, and that gives us an authenticity or legitimacy that those who, whom we oppose don't have. And then a final impl implication is a much, uh, as extending from what Kathy said, many greater battles over funding and an attempt to tap new funding sources. Often these groups draw upon a whole different set of uh, both wealthy supporters within a country, international supporters who are different from bilateral aid agencies and private <coughs> Western foundations, the transnational actors <coughs> who are willing to fund these groups, and also fighting over sources of funding within countries. I think Kathy mentioned the case of Poland, the establishment of the National Institute of Freedom, and its civil society uh, funding mechanisms, an attempt to take control of domestic funding sources and direct them to illegal groups in some cases. And so funding itself becomes contested, not just the legitimacy of accepting international funding, but a fight over domestic sources and a tapping of new international sources. So this trend towards greater illiberal social movements and organizations is throughout the world. <coughs> It's due to deep structural trends. It has significant implications for civil society assistance and the kinds of organizations and values which have traditionally been characteristic of them. Yet it's, it's an area which has been understudied and underexamined because it's often people and organizations whom we don't know, don't have contacts with, and have not been engaging with very much. So we're urging people in the work we've been doing at Carnegie on this issue for people to take a broader look at civil society and try to open their perspective and see the sector in this new, uh, updated, and uh, more complicated light. Thomas, thank you. That was really um, informative and comprehensive. Um, really appreciated your bringing out um, the importance. First of all, this is an understudied area that needs more attention and thankfully is getting more attention. Um, the heterogeneity of civil society organizations now um, is really, you brought that out well. Um, helpful definition around illiberal social movements, what that means, including tactics, breaking that down. Um, I think it's really also helpful to show the sort of historic roots or causes and deeper sort of socioeconomic uh, causes uh, for, for the rise of these movements. And very importantly, of course, the practical day-to-day -day implications in the civic domain around you know, the internal contestation, very important. And then you brought up that important point, echoing Kathy too, around the impact on financial uh, sustainability. Um, we saw that, of course, with the CSO SI capturing that uh, pretty clearly. So thank you very much. Very helpful, uh, both for um, uh, question and answers and for our uh, breakout groups later, hopefully, to come to some maybe ideas around how to address these important issues. Um, and so your, your point, uh, last point, or one of your last points about the, the contestation over finances um, is, I think, a really good segue uh, to you, Jenna. Um, great to have you here because I know you're going to be covering um, that area around reduced funding and threats to financial viability, um, which, of course, again, was uh, such an important theme echoed in the index. Um, so maybe a couple questions for you. Um, uh, so here we are. Um, what are some of the main elements of how CSOs are currently funded and supported that are preventing them from reaching financial viability in the long term? And second, what are some alternative models CSOs have used to attempt to increase their financial sustainability 
and their CSO sector self-reliance more generally. Have any of these models shown success? Right. Well, thank you. Uh, to your first question on the barriers, um, there are really three that have come to our attention through our work on this facilitating financial sustainability work that we've undertaken with um, Foundation Center and Peace Direct. So we'll start with the most obvious and then work our way to the most surprising. So the first is restrictive funding, which probably is not a surprise to most of the people sitting in this room. So restrictive funding, we're continuing to find funding focused on activities and very little funding that's available for capacity building. So our research looked at grants in six countries. So we looked at uh, grants that were in Foundation Center's database for Uganda, DRC, Colombia, Mexico, Bosnia, and the Philippines. In these grants, we found that only 5% had any element related to financial sustainability for the civil society organization that was being funded. Within that 5%, what was surprising to us was the disparity among sectors. So nearly 70% of that 5% that had a sustainable financing element <coughs> was focused on human rights organizations. The next largest was advocacy. So we have a couple of working hypotheses around that. Um, human rights, uh, leading into your second question, uh, we find that these organizations are less likely to have a social enterprise or alternative funding model. Um, around advocacy, our working hypothesis is that by the nature of their work, they're highly visible and perhaps relative to over other sectors, have an increase in this kind of funding. So that <coughs> focus on activities and limited financial sustainability is leading to some perverse behaviors that we'll get to later. Um, the other finding we found around barriers really relates to internal capacity building. So there are two elements here. One is under internal capacity building, the primary barrier cited by civil society organizations really relates to governance and a lack of support in this area, particularly around succession planning for their organizations. The other element there is the <coughs> order in which they receive support. So it tends to be that financial support is then followed by capacity building support due to identification of a problem, rather than building the internal capacity of the organization to prime them to be ready to take in funds. And that's been a consistent complaint that we've heard through our research, um, not only looking at the database, but also several interviews with civil society organizations in those countries, as well as with funders. The most surprising finding, though, around barriers is that growth is really a barrier to financial sustainability. <coughs> and the reason for that is that growth of an organization tends to undermine one of the key enablers, which is social capital. So as an organization grows, it tends to follow the needs of donors and donor priorities and lead organizations to stray from community priorities. And so being <coughs> central to a community and having that social capital is critically important for sustainability in the long run, especially during the lean times between these large external grants uh, we find that civil society organizations are really leaning on their communities for volunteer work, for staff to go for a period perhaps without pay, for local fundraising, and so this growth and chasing the large international donor dollars is really leading them to leave behind some of their community-based work. Mm -hmm. And so what all of this is leading to is a few ways that um, civil society organizations are trying to combat this. One that we've talked about, and again, is probably not surprising to folks in this room, is a focus on social enterprise. Um, but I would caution that when we dig into that and ask civil society organizations why they're doing that, I'm tempted to drop the word social and just say enterprise. So civil society organizations are feeling a pressure to really have two parts to their organizations. One part that's focused on bringing in revenue, whether it's tied to their mission or not, for some sectors, that's obvious. You hear a lot of you know, women's empowerment, economic development. It's very easy for them to find a social enterprise model that fits under their larger mission. But we're hearing about organizations from, with other areas of focus that are just trying to get funds in through any means possible. 
And it's just enterprise. It's not directly related to their mission. And in fact, it's diluting their efforts towards achieving their social mission. And the third element there that we're hearing about is this continuous effort on the part of many civil society organizations to double dip or find synergies. So having multiple funders funding the same activities or allowing them to operate in a way that they can generate some savings. And what we've heard from organizations is that in particular, they feel that it's challenging because if they realize any savings, they have to give that back. So there's no opportunity for them to really increase their effectiveness working in the current donor model. Well, okay. Jenna, thank you. That's um, really helpful food for thought. Um, uh, and I think really helpful granular uh, sort of analysis around the challenges that CSOs are facing around financial sustainability. Really important that you differentiated, for example, between human rights organizations and advocacy organizations, getting back again to the point that it's not a sort of homogeneous or one-size-fits-all sort of perspective. Um, really important about that challenge around, um, you know, that, that CSOs face around dealing with, you know, different donor demands and um, how to both grow and yet maintain social capital, that crucial tie to social capital and, and really the inherent DNA of their mission, so to speak. Uh, that was really well said. And that sort of accounting and sort of challenges around, um, you know, dealing with financing around uh, multiple funders at the same time. So I'm sure the breakout groups and some Q&A will uh, really get into that more. So thank you so much. Um, and then for a few more minutes, we've got about five more minutes, um, uh, Joseph, Sani and um, Jennifer, if you don't mind sort of speaking to uh, these themes that you've heard from a regional perspective, particularly as it pertains to the CSO, SI, so maybe some trends, again, sort of echoing what we heard earlier too around um, how Sub-Saharan Africa, some themes that speak to these trends, and also Central and Eastern Europe. And then we'll uh, open it up to Q&A. Take it away. Okay. Um, well, unfortunately, all of these trends have really been reflected in um, all of the editions of the index, including the one for Europe and Eurasia. Um, I wanted to, I feel like everything that we heard up here was pretty negative about mm -hmm. all of the huge challenges that civil society is facing. I wanted to maybe focus on some positives to end on a, on a higher note. Um, and and talk about some of the things, particularly about financial sustainability, other examples that we've seen in Central and um, Eastern Europe and Eurasia in particular that CSOs are doing to try to increase their sustainability and overcome some of the challenges that Jenna's mentioned, which have been mentioned throughout the reports. Right. Um, the first one is crowdfunding, um, which is still a small source of funding overall, but is growing, and many of the reports talk about growth in crowdfunding models. Um, so, for example, the Russia report talks about the fact that contributions made in Russia through crowdfunding is growing at more than 200% a year. So, it's definitely, you know, a, a potential future. Um, and one of the things that I think is interesting is about crowdfunding is that it really forces CSOs to prove their legitimacy, to work on their public image, to connect with communities as opposed to responding to donor priorities that are out there. Um, to date, crowdfunding still tends to be most successful, at least according to the, the CSOSI reports, what we've seen for groups that are working on social service issues. Those tend to be the issues that people respond to most directly and maybe see the most direct benefit. Um, but there were some good examples this year of CSOs also using crowdfunding platforms uh, to raise money for human rights and democracy issues. So in Belarus, obviously one of the more restrictive environments out there, there was a, a group called, or campaign called BY Help that raised $55,000 this year to help victims of political repression in the country during mass protests during the year. Um, the Czech Republic report talked about peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, so that is what many of you have probably seen on Facebook where your friend is celebrating a birthday and they're asking people to contribute to a cause that they think is important. That's becoming more common out there. Um, and we also see examples of CSOs using those technologies to reach beyond their borders. So reports in Armenia and Moldova talked about using crowdfunding or ICT platforms to reach out to the diaspora. Um, and then Nepal also uh, collected funds from the diaspora to help rebuild houses in flood affected areas during the year. Yeah. And Bulgaria and Serbia um, both talked about using the international global giving platform to reach potential donors, um, which I thought was interesting. Um, another thing that I wanted to mention was um, different legal mechanisms that can be used to create new funding sources. 
Uh, Central and Eastern Europe obviously has made more advances in terms of moving away from this reliance on foreign donors than most of the other regions that we cover. Um, you know, 10, 15 years ago when they were joining the EU, they were talking about, you know, how were they going to survive with this loss of USAID funding and, and other traditional funding mechanisms. And one of the things that many countries in the region have done was create these percentage mechanisms where um, they pass laws that allow taxpayers to designate a certain percentage of their income taxes to certain CSOs. Um, and so countries like Hungary, Lithuania, Poland, Romania, Slovakia, Slovenia, they all have such laws. Um, and they have actually provided a pretty significant source of income for CSOs. So we've talked about the negatives in Poland in terms of how they're looking to control certain sources of funding for CSOs, but they do still have a percentage mechanism. And um, in 2016, you had 13.6 million people, about half of the taxpayers in the country, taking advantage of that and designating 660 million Polish slati, which is almost $200 million to CSOs. So it is a potentially significant source of money. Um, so far, it still, relatively speaking, benefits a small number of organizations. They had over 8,000 groups that received some support from this kind of mechanism in 2017, um, but just 10 organizations received almost 40%. So it's obviously a very lopsided source of funding for groups. Um, but there is, again, a tie with legitimacy and proving their worth to constituents because they have to actively reach out to citizens, educate them about the work they're doing, and encourage them to take the step of you know, filling out this extra line on their tax forms to do that. Um, so the Moldova report talked about that this year and that connection. They're one of the newest countries to adopt this kind of mechanism, um, and 2017 was the first year that taxpayers could uh, contribute 2% of their taxes to groups. And so CSOs were really active and they were out there and they were trying to encourage, CSO, or encourage taxpayers to take advantage of that. It was a pretty small amount of people who did that in this first year. They reported that it was just 21,000 people and just $160,000 that came to CSOs in that way. But they also noted that of those people, almost half of them were people who did not have to fill out tax forms but only filled out the tax forms so they could designate money to those CSOs. Um, so, you know, there's, there's some good news out there and some positives, so I just wanted to, yep. to reflect on some of that. No, thank you for bringing out that perspective and some of those very interesting, uh, I'll be really creative ways around funding and tapping into the, that. So, wonderful. Sani? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, we've continued in that momentum of positive news. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think uh, the trends are there, they are known. Uh, yeah. And the way the reports portray those trends is a form of stressors. These trends are stressors, and therefore CSO have to cope with those trends. Right. So if you look at it from that perspective, we see that um, in sub-Saharan Africa at least, uh, and I think that's true for any other region, uh, that CSO are facing those adverse trends with creative and innovative ways. Uh, I will focus a little more on growing authoritarianism and then uh, closing space. Uh, we, we find in the report that uh, some CSO are using new ways of organizing and advocacy, for example, uh, in terms of advocacy, because even in those repressive <coughs> regimes, the government recognizes the value of service provision. And so, uh, and just to your point, uh, the civil society is not homogeneous. So you have service prov uh, uh, provision CSO where so they will use that as a way to engage with the government and push some changes around service delivery because the government will be more receptive. Uh, they will also use uh, other forms of advocacy such as uh, social movement. We saw that in Namibia with the landless uh, people movement uh, to push for some land reforms. Uh, they will use uh, internet with hashtag movement um, and other form of informal campaigns uh, to push uh, the agenda forward. So people are trying to be creative in that regard as far as advocacy. And even in terms of funding, I mean you mentioned crowdfunding, there are other ways even around service provision and then I think it's important to make that difference. I mean, and CSO understand uh, that uh, social enterprise have become an euphemism. So they are pretty clear in terms of, okay, we have a business side around service provision. We try to engage in cost recovery service provision while we are doing social activities. So, uh, so uh, it's important to mention that. And also, all those 
forms of innovation are ways to adapt to a changing environment. But they are also good news. They are not just adapting. They are trying to be part of bigger systemic, systemic changes. We saw that in Gambia or Angola, where CSO will leverage uh, some contextual opportunities like what happened in Gambia, the revolution, uh, to partners with other sectors to actually steer change mm -hmm. so that they don't relieve the experience of dictator's regime. So in Gambia, for example, they are actually working with the government mm -hmm. to try to see how to keep up the promises of the, I mean, the, 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 uh, the, the regime change. Uh, same thing in Angola where they were very instrumental to work on voter education, the electoral process. We see that in Zimbabwe as well. So they are, we are shifting. I mean, it's still embryonic, but um, there is a strategic shift from just resisting or adapting to actually begin to bring transformation in the society. Of course, it will not happen overnight. It, it's a difficult journey. It's a complex one. And in the report, uh, the report tried to capture that and provide more insights uh, to policymakers and intervener to these uh, individual uh, difficult experiences, but hopeful experiences. Wonderful. Thank you. I think that's uh, really uh, inspirational and important to bring out how in all of these challenging contexts there is this resilience and creativity and innovation that's uh, being fomented and playing itself out. So fantastic. Um, really, you all laid out such interesting and helpful perspectives. Um, I'm sure there are quite a few, or could be quite a few questions from the audience. So we have an, about 10 minutes or so. Maybe David will be kind and give us even a couple extra few minutes too. Uh, but uh, so why don't you um, step up to the microphones. We have microphones uh, here and just um, introduce yourselves and uh, feel free to address a question or questions to the speakers. Okay, great. Hi, I'm Smriti Lakhe from Root Change. Um, really interesting perspectives. I think I learned lots of new things um, in terms of the complexity of civil society organizations. What I think I didn't hear very much of, and Sani, you pointed it out towards the end, is the importance of working in systems. Um, we, I mean, we have completely drank the Kool-Aid of um, you know, systems thinking and capacity 2.0 that USAID has been promoting. And I'm, I'm curious to hear from you what kind of trends you're seeing in civil society organizations to, to adopt this thinking and what are some of the challenges that you're seeing? Wonderful, great question. Particularly surround systems, you want to address that? Any, and any of the panels can jump in. Go ahead, Sonia. Uh, I, I think um, there is a recognition in the civil society and then, uh, that you cannot tackle illiberal uh, tactics or dictatorial or repressive government alone. So that's one. And so there is a need, and then we saw it, we see it in the report that one of the sectors, one of the aspects of the report, sectoral infrastructure has improved because uh, there is that recognition uh, that they have to work, they have to build more solid alliance to tackle, uh, uh, um, to tackle uh, the, uh, those authority, um, repressive regime. So that's one aspect. Uh, but again, I think it's more for intervener. The system approach is more for, of course, for civil society actors, for policy maker, but more interestingly, it will also speak to donors to look at those environments as systems and therefore make sure, understand that the minute you intervene, you become part of that system. And so think through your own uh, interventions. I think that, that recommendation would be more useful for people who are trying to influence uh, or help uh, civil society in the face of these adverse trends. I would maybe just um, briefly add that one of the things that I see come up in CSO SR reports a lot related to Sani's point about donors thinking about their influence on um, sectors is, you know, donors often come in and they try to encourage CSOs to work in coalitions, but at the same time, I think you often see 
that because there's this fierce competition for donor funding, that that is an automatic disincentive to CSOs working together a lot of the time. So there's kind of this conflicting pool by donor's presence. And then I will add, we saw it in Liberia. For example, in Liberia, donors shifted their funding to support elections, fair enough. But many organizations, of course, those big organizations shifted their priority for, to, so, to work on elections. But when the elections were over, the donors pulled out their money, and some organizations actually ceased to exist virtually. And that was not a well thought approach, for example. We ignore the impact of um, our actions in that environment. To build on that, the second phase of our FFS work after this research is to support three action learning groups in Colombia, DRC, and Uganda, which are just getting off the ground now. Um, they have between eight and 15 civil society representatives that are supposed to be focusing on the systems level, really towards the aim of collective action. And at least in Uganda, where they're really focusing on is building trust between civil society and government. And they've really cited a lack of other funding opportunities, which has been mentioned, um, to be able to do that and engage in that kind of collective action. And it's because the funding has been targeted for activities that have to benefit the sector as a whole that's really forcing this group to work together in this way. And they've really cited a lack of other opportunities besides one organization taking the initiative to go about this and try and bring others on board um, to engage in these kind of activities. So we'll, we're very interested to see how this goes. It's still early in the process, um, but it seems like it's a combination of a lack of funding targeted at those activities, um, and it's sort of a new way of thinking for civil society organizations in terms of acting on behalf of the sector versus for their own individual aims when it comes to using donor funds. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Marianne? Yes, hi. Marianne Yerkes, USAID. So um, to take us back to the dark side for a minute, um, <laughs> you referenced many of you the resurgent authoritarianism, the contestation of civic space and civil society. Um, we also obviously see that and are hearing about that in terms of contestation of the information space, disinformation, the use of new technologies of artificial intelligence, kind of looking at the horizon of kind of the negative side of what can happen, right? And so I'm curious on two fronts. One is to what extent did the index and the reports actually pick up any trends related to that space, really in that kind of disinformation or the use, you know, this type of new front, if you will, of, of attack. And then also the extent to which um, civil society actors, maybe separate from the reports, but maybe from your research, uh, on the ground kind of understand this. I mean, many of us don't even understand it, but to what extent is civil society starting to recognize this new space and the need to better understand that and to reach out to different stakeholders who may understand it better to, to form coalitions? Great question. I assume that can be for any of you all. So jump in. Um, I'll, I'll take a stab. I mean, the index reports, it's definitely mentioned in several, this rise of disinformation and how CSOs are responding to it. Um, one off the top of my head that I remember is the Burma report and it talks about how Facebook was used by liberal groups to really incite um, animosity towards the Rohingya, which led to the, the crisis there. Um, there was less, I think, about how civil society can react effectively to that, so I think that's something that we still need to, to think about how to, to address in the reports more effectively. Great. Tom? Yeah. yeah, the same in India where WhatsApp is very widely used in India, as people know, and it's become a place of defining <clears throat> segregated communities of people, in some cases, who uh, meet up and get to know each other, and then WhatsApp has been used in a number of places to stir up uh, violence against uh, particular people or groups. But other civil, civic groups that oppose that are trying to get organized and to think about better ways to not necessarily sort of regulate media, but better ways to use it and to present it to users. So certainly, social media has become part of the contested zone of, of the contestation of civil society and civic groups no longer, the sort of liberal civic groups in the, the broader democratic sense of the word no longer see it as necessarily their domain, but they realize they have to fight for it and they have to define how it can be used and, and how it can be, you know, in some cases, regulated more effectively as opposed to 10 years ago when they thought, oh, this will be just a great empowerment tool for us. We'll own this space. They don't. <coughs> they see it being used against them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. 
I agree. I think we have seen the index and, and, and other sources, of course, picking up on the rise of disinformation and the use of social media in, in, in a liberal fashion. The one part of your question I think we haven't seen much of yet is artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. That hasn't started to rise, I think, in the index reports, but I think that's reflective of the fact that it hasn't risen in civil society's attention yet. In other words, there's a whole lot of room, I think, for educating our civil society partners about the, both the threats and opportunities that are posed by AI. Um, because I know it's certainly in my work, I haven't seen too much awareness of that on the ground yet. And I think that it's, again, a place where there's a lot of room for growth. Thank you. Great. Okay, we have time for, oh gosh, at least two more. Let's, let's try and get all three of you. Last three questions, we'll kind of group them together. So if you just, each of you raise your questions and we'll try and have the panelists answer. Uh, hi, my name, is, uh, my name is Rafael Mimoun. I'm with Horizontal. We, develop, uh, we leverage technology for human rights. Um, so it's a follow-up on the previous question. Um, I, I, I'm interested in hearing your thoughts more generally about technology, not just disinformation, but how the development of technology, how the, um, the fact that most, you know, in, in most places in the developing world today, um, many people have access to smartphones. Uh, on social media, how that's uh, impacted um, the work of civil society um, and, and the journey to, uh, to self-reliance. I think that the, the point of, on crowdfunding was, was quite interesting and, and, and quite relevant, but I'm interested if there are other aspects of technology and, and tele technological progress that has been impacted as well. Great, and then we'll take the other two questions. And yes, yeah, Mason Ingram from PACT. Um, I, I really appreciated Thomas Carruthers, um, your discussion of the heterogeneity uh, within civil society and the extent to which there's really a contest, contest in many cases between liberal and illiberal civil society, um, which I think has been echoed by others. I'm interested in how much do you think we know about what allows liberal civil society, as we would define it, to effectively defend their legitimacy um, and position themselves um, effectively to win the argument with those that are really systematically trying to undercut uh, their perceived legitimacy. Great. That's super. Thank you. And John? Um, I'd like to bring it back to a nuts and bolts question, back to the, the, the overall topic of journey to self-reliance. As Kate mentioned, USAID is taking a very substantial <clears throat> kind of refocusing on some longer-term goals. And just last week, they, they released a new acquisition and assistance strategy, which really emphasized co-design, co, um, co collaboration, longer-term um, commitments, less transactional engagement, a range of things that speak to kind of the development of thinking. If there was, for each of you, is there one thing, what would be the, the most important change in donor, or you say particularly, but donor funding and support to civil society that you think would be most critical to, to enable this sustainability? Great, okay. So wonderful, thank you all. Um, so we have the question around uh, technology, a little bit more around that and how it's impacting civil society organizations. What allows civil society organizations who are under attack from uh, the liberal movements to win the argument? <coughs> to speak and, and then um, this question, the last question around uh, recommendations, the, the key recommendations for donors in terms of civil society and sustainability. So I'll let you all just have at it. Well, one to address the question on legitimacy. Um, we've done some work on that at Carnegie over the past year, and I, I, I could recommend to you a study we published in April or May on our website called Examining Civil Society Legitimacy, where we asked a number of activists in different countries to probe uh, the fight for legitimacy. In, in sort of 20 second summation, it was don't appeal to legitimacy through the appeal to universal principles. That that's your instinct as a human rights defender or as a women's rights activist or LGBT activist or whatever it happens to be. That isn't what's gonna get you the legitimacy, it's the appeal to the universal principle. What's gonna get you the legitimacy much more often is concretely how is your, describe how your work is helping certain people improve their lives day to day much more concretely. And secondly, make much clearer who your partners are, who do you actually work, who are you associated with? Because sort of the associational definition of identity has become so much more important. Electronically, we sort of see around the world and see the voter trends as 
who you know and who your immediate community is defines you. So don't say, we stand for these things, instead say, we accomplish this, and these are the people who are our closest partners and why. And that's a better start for legitimacy. I don't mean to sound, make it sound like it's a simple formula, mm -hmm. but there are some trends. That if you take a look at the report, it comes uh, to a whole analysis of what are some of the pluses and minuses of different approaches to achieving legitimacy. Great, thank you. Some of the other topics raised, anyone wanna take a jump at them? Um, I think on the issue of technology, there's a lot. I mean, I couldn't possibly cover it in a simple answer, but you know, we've seen some of the more obvious um, uses of technology to organize. I mean, certainly assemblies and the like, using smartphones to get around restrictions on, on assembly. Um, certainly fundraising, it's not just crowdfunding, but things like SMS messaging mm -hmm. to raise money. Um, and even mobile platforms we're starting to see in sort of cooperative efforts between government and CSOs to put out information about how do you register, you know, what, what are your obligations under the law as a CSO, things like that. So we've, uh, those are just three examples of probably hundreds of ways that CSOs are using technology these days to um, navigate their spaces. Great. Thank you. Sonny? Yeah, I think just on technology, I mean, there's also the need to build evidence base, and then they are using technology for that to collect data, to do research. Uh, people want to see uh, the return on investment, it's based on data, and so they are using technology for that. Uh, just to also go back to the question you asked, what will change or what recommendation in terms of donor recommendation to support CSOs? I think, I mean, there's a lot that can be done, but start to start by understanding the, the resilience strategy, what they are using to resist or adapt or transform the system and focus on that. Not the negative, but look at the efforts that are, are going on and support, zoom in la, like a laser on those efforts and support those. And then and adapt your system yourself. I think that's the thing. We try to, we want them to become Denmark, but we don't want to change. So. Uh, Try and be with, yeah, to accept that we will have to change so that to meet them where they are will be a good start. Thank you. Thank you, panelists. We really appreciate it. A round of applause. We really appreciate great groundwork. Thank you. It's a lot of great food for thought. Um,